I killed him with a plastic bag. Uh, I put that over his head and killed him with that. In the summer of 1993, detectives were hunting a killer who was preying on London's gay community. People became really paranoid. There was this real sense of fear within the community. His reign of terror led to the deaths of five men, all brutally murdered in their own homes. The body was laid out on the bed. It was bound. The noose was still around his neck. Detectives' worst fears were realized when the killer revealed his motive. His motivation seems to be in this, uh, this quest for infamy, to be a serial killer. The series of murders committed by Colin Ireland were crimes that shook Britain. During the 1990s, the Colherne pub in West London was renowned within the capital's gay community a cavernous, dimly lit bar that attracted men who were into sadomasochism. The Colhern back then was the destination venue for gay leather men in London. The windows were blacked out, so you couldn't see inside. It was quite industrial, the decor inside. You did sometimes see sex on the premises. The method of meeting people in the Colham pub was quite straightforward. Uh, people were there with similar interests, so um, walking up to strangers and engaging in conversation was not unusual at all. Taking that person home, a person you've only met for a few minutes, happens as well. On the 8th of March, 1993, Peter Walker, a renowned assistant theatre director working in London's West End, visited the Colhern. He was a regular there and openly gay. There were also suggestions that he was interested in the S&M scene. That night, he happened to bump into a man spilling his drink on him. The pair started talking, and it wasn't long before Peter Walker invited the man back to his home. One of the tough realities that we as a community of gay men have to take on board is that we do put ourselves into vulnerable situations in the pursuit of sex. This isn't to say that this is true of everybody, of course it isn't, but there is a sizable minority of, of gay men who will go out and they will go home with somebody knowing nothing about them. The chances are that not only do you not know them, but also that they're, they're likely to be into bondage. So we have a situation where Peter Walker has admitted a complete stranger into his flat with his keys, so there's no forced entry. Agreed to being tied to a bed frame. Once his victim was incapacitated and vulnerable, the stranger revealed his true intentions. He wasn't there for sex, he was there to kill. With Walker tied up, his murderer placed a plastic bag over his head and suffocated him. He then remained in the flat, cleaning it and just being patient, waiting for the rush hour to begin in the early, early hours of the morning. He wiped any surface that he had touched clean of his fingerprints. Uh, moreover, he bagged up uh, his clothing uh, after he'd committed the crime and destroyed it. And at seven o'clock, he then left and just mingled out with the crowds and just blended into obscurity. The killer harbored a bizarre obsession. He had vowed to become a serial killer. He would go on to strike fear into the heart of London's gay community for the next four months. One of the first detectives at the scene of the Walker murder was Martin Finnegan. Got a call from our uniform colleagues saying they'd been called to a flat down by Battersea. Inside the corridor, there's a room on the left-hand side, the bedroom, and in there, Peter Walker was laying on the bed. I would buy a duvet, which had some teddy bears on top arranged in a 69 position, the, the two teddies on top. One of the most interesting things there was the ligature marks on his wrists and ankles, and there's no ligatures at the scene. So that raised the idea that whoever had killed him had taken away the ligatures and who knows what else as well. The macabre scene that greeted the detectives bore all the hallmarks of a deranged killer at work. It would be a scene that would be repeated another four times before he was caught. Police also discovered that Walker's cash card was missing, 
and a close look at his bank account revealed that money had been withdrawn after he had died. Theft from the victim's bank accounts would be another clue that would help detectives catch the killer. He got into the habit in his early crimes of reimbursing himself uh, for the expense of committing them and having murdered them, he would go off to uh, a cash point um, and uh, using their PIN number and their credit card, he then took out, I think in uh, certainly three cases, uh, at least 200 pounds, I think. Apart from this though, the murder detectives had little to go on. We're hopeful. We're optimistic that we'll uncover some forensic evidence which would help us identify who his killer was. As it turned out, very frustratingly, there was very, very little to go on. And it became apparent that whoever had been responsible for Peter's death had taken some time to remove anything that could be forensically useful to us. Hello, Samaritans. Shortly after the discovery of Peter Walker's body, Telephone helpline charity The Samaritans received a call from a man concerned about two dogs who he claimed were locked in Walker's flat. The Samaritans received two phone calls on the afternoon evening of the day Peter Walker's body was discovered from a chap alerting us to the fact that two dogs were locked up in the flat. And when questioned further, he said that the reason I know is because I, I locked them there and the flat's locked and uh, I've killed the person in the flat. Although there was little forensic evidence at the scene, the detectives investigating the murder quickly realized that to have any chance of catching the killer, they would have to work closely with the gay community in London, a relationship that at the time was full of fear, suspicion and anger. Put it this way, when, when the police had gone to the coal home to try and get information, most of the people in the coal hearn will have remembered not, not long before, six months maybe, the police turning up at the Vauxhall Tavern in Vauxhall where Lily Savage was performing and raiding the pub wearing rubber gloves in case they caught AIDS off people. So that's the kind of expectation of the police that we had as a community. So if the uniformed officers turning up at a gay venue, automatically people were very, very frightened and very hostile. Perhaps this inquiry was a, a catalyst for getting both sides to work together. It was in everyone's interest that Peter Walker's killer was found and there was no time for posturing as to the rights and wrongs of any sides there. We had work to do, we need to find this killer, so let's work together. This spirit of cooperation, though, was hampered by a law lord's ruling the day after Walker's body was found that stated that men could be found guilty of assault if they engaged in even consensual sex that caused bodily harm. The gay community rightly asked why they should give statements that may well help police catch Walker's killer, but might also later land them in prison. Despite this, police pressed on. But after weeks of investigation, and despite countless avenues of inquiry, the detectives' attempts to solve the murder of Peter Walker were going nowhere. Police say he'd been suffocated, and marks on his wrist suggest at some stage he'd been tied up. We actively pursued Peter Walker's death. We left no stone unturned. We made diligent inquiries at the Colhern pub and uh, was amongst the gay community. We built up a deep understanding of how Peter lived his life and his, his social activities, his sexual activities. So we knew an awful lot about Peter and that gave us the strongest indication of probably how he met his death, but we didn't have that final link. So that was frustrating. Our inquiries with his colleagues and friends had come to a natural end. There was really nowhere else for us to go. So these inquiries cannot go on forever. There are implications for resources, so we did start scaling the inquiry down. And it was at that point then that other murders started happening. The man who killed Peter Walker was Colin Ireland. His perverse desire to become a serial killer would result in the deaths of four more men. In 1993, police investigating the murder of Peter Walker were faced with their inquiry grinding to a halt. They had discovered a host of facts about the victim, 
He was gay and active in London's S&M community. He'd been killed in his flat by an unknown attacker, an attacker who had removed all forensic evidence from the scene. After 10 weeks, detectives were nowhere nearer solving the crime. What they didn't know at the time was that they were faced with a murderer who held a macabre obsession to become a serial killer. His name was Colin Ireland. Ireland was born in 1954 in Dartford, Kent. His natural father walked out on his family shortly after Colin's birth, leaving his mother to bring him up alone. Mother was 17 when she had him, uh, various partners coming in and out, various stepfathers, lots of moves, different schools, very much put into the role of a loner, an outsider. Does that explain his behaviour? No, because a lot of other people are unfortunately put in that situation and they don't kill. What we do know is that a lot of serial killers have dysfunctional backgrounds, but it's not to say every has a dysfunctional background is going to be a killer, because they're not. Ireland's adolescence was spent in and out of young offenders' institutions for various petty crimes. Colin Ireland's history was that he had no hint that he was into sexual uh, GBHs and assaults. He was a burglar, uh, a bit of fraud, robbery. After a first marriage that ended following an affair with another woman, Colin Ireland arrived in Devon, where he would meet his second wife, Janet Young. I first met Colin when I had a pub. I was a publican in Devon. It was quite amazing, really, his first entrance into the pub. He was a big man and he was dressed in camouflage, although he's never actually been a soldier, although people describe him as that. He never described himself that way. And he stood in the doorway and the whole conversation in the pub just stopped and everybody turned and looked at him. We got talking and um, we spent the whole nearly the whole night talking, we had quite a lot in common. We got married in January of 1990. We were both really rather control freaks, so um, I recognised that in him and he in me, and we both wanted the last word in any disagreement, although we didn't argue a lot, but if we were having a debate and what, so forth, we would uh, all both want the last word. The problem when you have control freaks, if you don't allow them to have control, then they can lose it. And I would imagine that his wife would have reported cases of incidents where he had lost his temper over something. Because if you break down that control or you challenge that control, they will respond with aggression. It was late at night and I had a bed and breakfast. And uh, we'd gone to bed and we'd had a, a discussion. And I had, I had won and he had lost control of me. He threw me out of the bedroom into the hallway where all the guest bedrooms were. So I went into one of the empty guest rooms. He banged on the door and he came into the room and he broke the light bulb so that I couldn't see where he was. And he stood in different corners of the room and called out to me, saying, I'm over here, I'm over here. Just, just really frightened me, actually. It didn't touch me, but it was scary. What they normally do is put enough fear into the partners that the partners don't want to upset them, and then they control them that way. The fear of violence is often more powerful than the actual violence. After getting married, the couple settled in Devon and ran the Globe pub together. When he wasn't working, Colin would head to Dartmoor, where he developed an interest in the outdoors. He did like to see himself as a survivalist, and he had all the gear, the the water perfurication tablets and all that kind of thing with him and he'd go out on the moors and he was going to go all night and catch a rabbit and all this sort of thing but actually he wasn't very good at it and he always came home for his tea. After only a few months of marriage, Colin had grown tired of his life in Devon. After the Easter holiday, Janet had visited friends in London, leaving her new husband on his own. He was due to come and pick me up on the Sunday and he didn't come and we assumed that there'd been an accident or something had happened, or a car had broken down. So we phoned the hospitals, we phoned the police, nobody had seen anything of him. We'd cleared my house out, everything went. And then he put my card in the machine and took out every penny that I had. I didn't even have the bus fare to get back from my parents, they had to lend me the money. I reported him missing, um, but the police said, well, he's just gone. I went bust. My children and I went into a homeless hostel. It was a nightmare. 
A few months after leaving Janet, Colin arrived in South End, Essex, and quickly found work at a homeless shelter. I was the manager of an emergency night shelter for homeless people in South End, and Colin was one of a team of volunteers. His responsibilities were staying awake overnight and being at the shelter in the event that there were any problems. First impressions of Colin were he's a very big man. He made it quite clear that he'd, he'd been to prison. He had apparently been involved in a robbery at a, a local cinema and had tied up someone, a manager or someone, at, at the uh, theatre and um, gone to prison for it. He did have some rather narrow opinions of certain sections of society. He was homophobic. He made it quite clear that uh, he didn't he didn't agree with homosexuality. He he didn't like the uh, the gay community at all. Colin's job at the shelter demonstrated his ability to blend in with society, earn the trust of others, and live a seemingly normal life. One of the interesting things about serial killers is the normality. A lot of them are usually quiet, insignificant people, don't have a history of violence, and people are always shocked. I didn't know him, but he seemed a very nice chap, is what you hear. He's usually insignificant. He's not the kind of guy that when you see walking up the street, you cross the road because you think, this one's going to be trouble. He isn't. Most serial killers don't have a very violent personality that's on display. They have violence underneath, but not on display. Ireland almost managed to completely obscure his dark side from his colleagues at the shelter. Only once did he let his guard slip. On one occasion, we had a particularly troublesome client at the night shelter who kept coming back and causing trouble over and over again. Colin, I assumed, was in jest. Suggested one day that he would be able to get rid of him. When I asked him, you know, in a light-hearted way, you know, how, he suggested that he could force a couple of snookle balls down his throat and get rid of him that way. Although Colin enjoyed his work at the night shelter, his colleagues were getting increasingly worried about his behaviour. Colin had worked at the night shelter for approximately a year. There had been some allegations during that time of inappropriate touching of some of the female members of staff. And uh, as a result of that, uh, Colin was asked to leave. After Colin left the night shelter, he got a job breaking up pallets in a local, for a local charity and um, felt rather demeanoured by that. And he just used to go off on what we thought were survival weekends. And on those occasions, he used to ask me, or me and my wife, to look after his bag and his belongings because he didn't think they were safe to be left in his bed set where he lived. In hindsight, it, it appeared that on those occasions, he wasn't going camping, he was going to London. It was on these trips to London that Colin Island began visiting the Colhearn pub and selecting his victims. He had seemingly got away with the murder of Peter Walker, and after a gap of two months, his killing spree was set to resume. On the 28th of May, he met 37-year-old librarian Christopher Dunn in the Colhearn and accompanied him back to his flat. Once inside, Ireland tied Dunn to his bed and tortured him by burning him with a cigarette lighter until he revealed his pin number. Once he was satisfied, Ireland strangled him with a length of cord. Afterwards, Colin Ireland meticulously cleaned the flat before stealing money from his victim's bank account. Christopher Dunn lived in Wilsdon, a single man living alone, and he was found face down, naked on his bed. The pathologist who examined the body said that the cause, he wasn't quite sure about the cause of death. It could have been uh, manual strangulation through uh, a sex act, a homosexual sex act that had gone wrong. The uncertainty surrounding Christopher Dunn's cause of death meant that the police inquiry was wound down. Colin Island had once again evaded the attention of the police, and by June 1993, he was ready to kill again. In the summer of 1993, 
a killer was on the loose, preying on London's gay community. Colin Island harboured a perverse desire to become a serial killer, and he had already murdered two men, Peter Walker and Christopher Dunn. The police, though, hadn't linked the crimes and were struggling for clues. Their investigations were also hampered by the fact that the community that Colin Island had targeted kept themselves deliberately private. I think the Colin Island picked up his victims at places like the Coalhearn was not accidental. Those spaces invited people who were maybe loners, maybe felt cut off from their surroundings, from their neighbours, from their families. So it was harder for the police to trace them. If you're broadcasting your sexual choices by the way you dress, by the, the code of the way that you look, which kind of proclaims not just that you're gay, but also that you're possibly into S&M and bondage, etc., etc., that kind of provides a very, very fertile hunting ground for somebody who would like to come and do you harm. I think the gay community are, are, are sitting ducks in that respect. The lifestyle lent itself to exploitation. Clearly, there's a certain element of trust that needs to go on between consenting people, and in which case, this trust was uh, betrayed. Possibly, Colin saw the gay community as, uh, as easy pickings. On the 4th of June, detectives received news of a third murder. This time, the victim was an American businessman working in London, 35-year-old Perry Bradley. I was on call as the senior investigating officer. The news of a body having been found in Kensington came in, and we went out to the scene, and that was Perry Bradley. The body was laid out on the bed, it was bound, the noose was still around his neck. There was no obvious sign of any um, struggle or fight. The crime scene indicated that there were sexual motivations. The way the body was arranged and laid out, it was clearly a little bit unusual. And we were a little bit surprised when we contacted the family and found that there was no apparent history of homosexuality or anything in his background whatsoever. This confusion about Perry Bradley's sexuality, along with the initial assumption that Christopher Dunn's death may not have been in fact a murder, meant that the Metropolitan Police now had three teams separately investigating the crimes of Colin Island. It was only when they uncovered the vital fact that Perry Bradley had also visited the Colhearn prior to his death that links began to emerge. With the inquiry still reeling from the discovery of Bradley's body, just three days later, police received the shocking news of a fourth killing. Well, I was on call, uh, Detective Superintendent for murders in the East End of London. I got a call to say that a man called Andrew Collier had been killed. Andrew Collier, aged 33, was a warden in a block of flats in North East London. He was openly gay and HIV positive and was also a regular visitor to the Colhearn, where he met Colin Island on the 7th of June. Two days later, his body was found lying on his bed with a dead cat draped over him and a condom in his mouth. Detectives immediately noticed similarities between this and the murder of Peter Walker three months earlier. Like the previous scenes, Collier's keys were missing and he had been robbed. Inquiries with local officers also provided another crucial breakthrough. I made inquiries of the local police to see if they had any calls at the scene, you know, you know, I had we missed an opportunity for a witness, and we, we confirmed that there had been a quite a, a serious street fight about half past 12, one o'clock in the morning. Aware of that, you know, what would you do if you heard noise at one o'clock in the morning? You get out of bed and have a look at the window. And, and you look at the window in the lounge, there's a bar across uh, Collier's uh, front room, and between the glass of pane and the bar, there was a finger mark facing downwards, and that's a mark that was lifted. So, great bit of forensication done by the officers at that scene. By leaving a fingerprint at the scene, Colin Island had presented the police with their first solid clue to his identity. However, back in 1993, no computerised database of prints existed to search against. Only when detectives had arrested a suspect could comparisons be made. For the time being, Island was seemingly in the clear. However, the different inquiry teams investigating the murders across London were beginning to notice similarities in the crime scenes. 
somebody brought to my notice the circulation concerning the Collier murder at that time. And we looked at it and thought, hey, there's similarities here. I need to talk to Albert about this. We talked on the phone, we, we, we shared crime scene photographs. He was concerned around making a link to the Collier and Walker case. He needed a bit of time just to firm up, talk to the family in America and make some more inquiries. It became known to me that the method in which Andrew Collier's body had been found it was very, almost identical to Peter Walker's. So if nothing else, that was a, a vital link between those two murders. We fairly quickly, I think, identified Walker, Bradley, Collier and Dunn was linked series. And we called a meeting of the respective investigating officers. And I remember it very well because we were talking about going over the forensics once again, the bodies, to see if we could find any common factors there, now that we knew it was probably a linked series. And I very well remember the guy from Wealdstone, the Dunn murder, saying, well, that may be a little bit difficult because at this moment, as we speak, he's being cremated. Um, and our hearts sank at that point, but nevertheless, you know, that was... That was the way that Dunn was brought into it. But fortunately, there was quite a lot of information available from the Dunn investigation that we were able to draw upon and pull into our investigations as well. There are links with all four murders, and that was pathologically established this afternoon. Finally, detectives began to make links between the Walker, Dunn, Bradley, and Collier murders. Confirmation that they were up against a serial killer, though, was to come from an unlikely source. Colin Ireland himself. On Saturday the 12th of June, the CID office at Battersea received a phone call from a man inquiring as to why the Peter Walker inquiry had been wound down, asking were we not interested in, in the death of a gay man. And he went on to say that he had killed him. He told us that he had already killed Mr Bradley in Kensington, Christopher Dunn in Wheelstone, and Andrew Collier in Hackney and said that he was going to carry on, that he wanted to be a, a serial killer, and that was his New Year resolution, and he carried on until we caught him. Why are you doing this? But what was, what was your aim in all that? Once you know you're dealing with a multiple killer, your priorities change, and it's the protection of life then that becomes of absolute paramount importance because this guy could be out there ready and wanting to kill again. As a killer, he's unusual in the sense that he's actually broadcasting his behaviour. He was the one that actually was saying, this is what I've done. I think with most serial killers, there's this element of play and taunting the police, so certainly, he was, he was playing games and he wanted the notoriety. What really frustrated him was the fact that we hadn't made any connections with the first killing and even the second killing had gone unnoticed when what he wanted was to be a serial killer. And so this is why he was trying to court the publicity, trying to get us to declare it to be a linked series in order that he could thrive in the publicity. On the 15th of June, police went public with the fact that a serial killer was on the loose in London. They held a midnight press conference, appealing for any information that might lead to the killer's arrest and warning the gay community that they were being targeted. Sadly, the warning would come too late for Ireland's fifth and final victim. By the middle of June 1993, Colin Ireland had killed four gay men in London. Police investigating the murders had finally come to the conclusion that the crimes were committed by one man and they were now officially hunting a serial killer. Detectives were stunned when they began receiving phone calls from the killer himself, taunting them and threatening to kill again. Phone calls are highly unusual. To have a killer contacting the authorities twice within a matter of days, making statements like, I killed them, and that was effectively a taunt. Why haven't you caught me yet? I'll carry on, I'll do some more. 
Again, highly unusual. This is not a man wishing to keep a, a low profile. In the last of the phone calls to the police on the 15th of June, Ireland had revealed that he had indeed killed again. He had met Emmanuel Spiteri in a tube station after noticing him at the Colhearn on the evening of the 12th of June. He'd gone home to Catford with Spiteri and after stealing his cash card and pin number, had strangled him to death. In an effort to destroy any evidence, he also set the flat on fire, although the flames quickly went out. After Spiteri's landlady discovered his body, police at the scene uncovered the fact that he was a regular at the Colhearn. They pieced together a route between his flat and the pub and noticed that the most likely way home went through Charing Cross Station, a station that had just been fitted with one of London's first CCTV cameras. After about 10 hours of viewing, we got the victim, Spiteri, with an image in the background that uh, ended up being Colin Island. Again, the priority was to protect life, and we felt that the image was sufficiently good so that um, two things might flow from that. A, people would be able to avoid him if he approached them at the Colhearn, and B, somebody who knew him well would probably, from the build, even though the facial features were a little bit distorted, from his build, height, and general demeanor of the footage, would be able to identify him, and so that triggered us into releasing the information. In the following days, police took the decision to release the image itself and were swamped with new leads, with Gallup, the gay London policing group, taking hundreds of calls. I think once there was a CCTV footage showing a man, that sort of changed the whole game, really, because suddenly here was somebody that people could, 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 could see and recognise, and that, that could have been your next-door neighbour walking along. The phones at Gallup went mad. People were phoning up nearly every day, either saying that they may have information. W was it safe to go to the Colhearn? Was it safe to be dressed in leather? I mean, people became really paranoid. There was this real sense of fear within the community. All sorts of names were propped up that had to be dealt with. So how do you prioritise? Which, which line of inquiry are you going to deal with first? And, and that was a, a tricky and difficult situation. Uh, to deal with at the time. The pressure was immense, you know, it really was. As the police got to work, Colin returned to his life in South End, always with one eye on the detective's frantic attempts to track him down. It was quite late into the period of time when Colin had been committing these crimes, and I was watching TV, Colin was here, it was the news, they were talking about the uh, gay slayings, as it was called. It was all over the news, and um, Colin turned to me and asked me, he said, you know, what do you think of this thing? And uh, my response was, oh, another nutter on the loose. And he, he just laughed. As the media attention grew, Colin Island could not escape the fact that the net was closing around him. He realised that things were closing in because, in fact, a couple of his associates, acquaintances, had gone to him and said, hey, Colin, that could be you. I was cooking in the kitchen and um, noticed an identikit picture in a local newspaper. And I thought to myself, you know, oh, it looks like Colin. Um, I didn't pay much attention to it and just generally dismissed it. And, of course, when the, the press turned up, um, that was one of the things that came to mind. And I realised that, yeah, he was definitely, definitely Colin. He came to our house and his demeanour and his whole attitude was, was very, very different to how it normally was. I offered Colin a lift home and he asked my daughter, my young daughter, did she want to go in with him to look at the gerbils? She said yes, as any little girl would. Do you want to see the gerbils? He took her hand and started to walk into the house. And I took her other hand and pulled her the other way and said, we hadn't got time, we had to leave. I remember exactly what, what he said. He was talking in the third tense. He said, to, I ask if she wants to see the gerbils. He says, no, we haven't got time. Yeah, let's go. I ask if I want to see the gerbils, he says, I haven't got time. Anyway, we got in the car and left him, and that was the last time I saw him. Realising the game was up, Colin Island, in control to the last, 
took matters into his own hands and visited his solicitor in South End. There, he signed an affidavit explaining why he was pictured with Spiteri on the CCTV image. He went to a solicitor after seeing his image on television and saying, I am the man in the video, but I'm not the killer. Yes, I did go to the Colhern. I met uh, Manuel Spiteri there. He invited me back to his flat in South London. We travelled on the train through Charing Cross. When I got to the front door, there was another man there. I didn't want to have a threesome, so I left immediately and slept in the local churchyard. Albert Patrick, examining recordings of Ireland's various phone calls, had uncovered a key background noise that originated from Fenchurch Street train station, the line that serves South End. Two days later, Ireland's solicitor, under instruction from his client, called the police. We went to his lawyer's office to speak to him. We obviously arrested him and interviewed him. The crucial thing was that at that point we were able to get his fingerprints having arrested him. Detectives immediately compared Ireland's fingerprints to the one they'd found in Andrew Collier's flat. They were a perfect match. We knew that he had been in the company of Spiteri, that we had a fingerprint of him inside Collier's flat, which he denied ever being to. So that gave us sufficient evidence. And we decided to charge him initially think just with the two murders because what he wanted was the notoriety of being a serial killer and we felt with him just being charged with the two murders it would cause him quite a bit of frustration and so that's what we did and then we waited to see how things developed. As detectives continued to build their case against Ireland he was remanded in custody where his frustration at only being charged with two murders was building. Three, four weeks later, when he was coming back for a hearing at the magistrate's court, that's when he said to his, uh, his escort officer that he wanted to confess. We had officers to escort him, so they, they took a, a brief note of what he was saying on the way back, took him to Edmonton Police Station where there was a, a, a new video system. For a long time, he denied it and then decided eventually to do it. And that's classic serial killer, is that serial killer keeps all the cards to himself, and then when he realises that the police have most of the cards, he then throws a hand in. I, uh, I, put the, I killed him with a plastic bag. Uh, I put that over his head and killed him with that. He decided to tell all, and he admitted to us the full extent of, of his involvement. He barely come to us quite quick. I, I throttled him with the noose, and he hardly struggled. And, um, um, Sam, for instance, Walker, it's a His interview, I found him willing to talk. I found him articulate and quite happy to provide details. Uh, he didn't need much prompting. He was calm, relaxed, you know, he didn't raise his voice. Tell me about the cat. How did you kill the cat? I um, stuck a noose around his neck and hung it over a door. Very factual about his acts as if he was describing someone else's uh, activities. Absolutely no compassion at all. Tell me again how Christopher Dunn died. Christopher Dunn, I, 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 with, 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 some, with some cord and manual strangulation. I didn't detect much hatred at the time. It was just matter of fact. Like, I went down the shops, I bought this, went into this flat and uh, killed him. It was just very matter of fact, a very unusual interview. Ireland wasn't remorseful. Ireland uh, positively boasted and gloated over the fact that he was a serial killer. During the interviews with Ireland, police were determined to uncover exactly why he decided to embark on his reign of terror and whether he was gay himself. We questioned Conan Arne very closely about his sexual orientation because having moved in gay circles and going home with gay men and murdering gay men after what could have been some sexual activity. It would have made sense had he been gay himself, but throughout all the interviews there, he absolutely refuted any suggestion that he was gay, which left the situation that he was even more calculated and cold than we first thought. It was the victim he was looking for. He was looking for somebody to kill, and gay SNM men are vulnerable in that sense. 
but he could have easily have killed prostitutes. It didn't really matter to him. It was the killing that was enjoyable. And as far as I understand, he never had sex with any of his victims. There's no evidence at all of any sexual attraction to the gay men. So it wasn't homosexual type behavior. It was simply they were vulnerable. During his interview, Ireland was only too pleased to recount in detail how he'd ensnared his victims before killing them. His ability to convince total strangers to do his bidding seems to be a trait he'd exhibited all his life. Colin was very manipulative, appeared to be genuine, and as a result was able to convince people to trust him and possibly go along with whatever he was, he was planning at the time. Perry Bradley was not into sadomasochism or bondage, and Ireland convinced him that this was the only way he could get any gratification, that he, Ireland, could, could get that. And so Perry Bradley agreed to go along with that, just as an example of his MO. So he was quite chillingly ruthless in the way that he went about his task. And after he'd killed Perry Bradley, he made himself a sandwich and stayed there until the morning when there were more people on the street and he felt he could more effectively make good at escape and mingle in with the commuters. Very chilling character. He actually stayed with them for several hours and that indicates to me somebody who's got credible amount of control and being able to sit there, watch television, knowing that you've killed somebody, knowing that you've got to kill time so that you can then make an orderly exit. If he left at three, for three or four o'clock in the morning, that would be noticeable. If he leaves at seven o'clock in the morning, he's just one of the great commuter class and nobody would notice it. That shows a lot of insight into behavior. Shows a very well organized killer. Colin Ireland pleaded guilty to the five murders and he was deemed so dangerous that he was sentenced to five life sentences with no possibility of ever being released from prison. I don't think anybody in court will ever forget uh, what the judge said about the horror of the multiple nature of these murders. Indeed, his phraseology sticks in my brain. He said, to take one life is an outrage. To take five lives is carnage. He definitely was uh, a man who needed to be locked away. And he said he was 60% uh, OK, decent guy, and 40% uh, uh, a nudge in him to kill gay men. And, and I think that's absolutely right. I think we're all born with the ability to go any direction. We've got all those things in us, good and evil, but our upbringing directs us in one way and most of us try to be good and some of us can't and I think you know that he um, he let the bad side of his nature take over and where most of us fight against that he let it take him over. There is an understandable human reluctance to imagine that anybody who can commit crimes of this gravity and this number cannot be normal by any canon that you or I or any other person might understand. The awful truth, I'm afraid, is that there are people who are just plain bad, and Colin Ireland was undoubtedly one of them. But when you have somebody who wasn't insane, that's much more worrying because we could all do that. In the 20 years since Ireland's killing spree, as well as making fundamental changes to the way murders are investigated, the police have worked hard to develop a solid, trusting relationship with the gay community. The fact that we now have LGBT liaison officers, the fact that anti-gay hate crime is actually treated seriously by the police, and I think because of that, the community is much more willing to work with the police when such things happen, which wasn't the case before. 20 years ago, that just wasn't the norm. We see ourselves more as citizens and we expect to be treated as citizens by the police in a way that we didn't before. Colin Ireland died of natural causes in Wakefield Prison in February 2012. His crimes, however, still linger with the detectives who helped catch him. My impression of Colin Ireland was absolutely focused on his mission, 
It was a perverse mission, uh, but one which he carried out with consummate skill, determination. He wanted to have his place in history as a serial killer. That is sadly what he achieved. Five people lie dead at his hand. <laughs>